Hi, my name is Hannah, and today we're interviewing Dominic. Based in Singapore, Dominic is a managing partner of one of the world leading consulting firms that provide residence and citizenship planning and advice for high net worth individual. Today, he gives us his view on key trends that require our attention as we emerge into a post-pandemic world. This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ.tax. Good evening, Dominic. How are you today? Very good, and you? Fantastic. Thanks for sharing your time. I know you're a super busy guy. So please, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Dominic Vonick. I'm uh, the managing partner for Henley and Partners, um, based here in Singapore. Uh, I'm also the head of South Southeast Asia for the firm, so looking after um, a couple of offices in the region, uh, and then also our group head of sales, so very much involved um, with our other offices on a more global perspective, from Canada down to Cape Town, London, Dubai, all the way through to Hong Kong. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the role, and then we, uh, so that the firm Henley and Partners, we are specialists in residence and citizenship planning. Um, so we specialize, well, we, we have two, two parts to the business. So the one is advising private clients. Um, these are sort of high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals and their families with how to, how and where to obtain residence by investment, or citizenship by investment. So of course, there's a, a number of countries around the world that have these investment migration programs that, that can be very attractive for, for wealthy um, people. And the other part of the business is government advisory. So I'm also very much involved in that side of the, of the, of the firm. Where we strategically um, are advising governments on how to design and implement these programs something that I think will, well, we've already seen an increase, but something that's going to pick up significantly now, I think, in a post-pandemic world. Mm, absolutely. And and that's why I guess the conversation with you is one that I was really looking forward to, because not just for some of my clients and people in my network, but also myself personally, I felt the impact of being displaced as a result of the, the disruptions. So as I shared with you before we started, you know, I've been living in Singapore for the last seven years, and... I just popped over to Indonesia for what I thought was like a three-day business trip, and I'm locked out of Singapore. And I guess if I did not have other options, it would have been, you know, uncomfortable given, you know, flight cancellations and whatever. So, you know, I take your point clearly. I would imagine that there's a, a definite upswing in demand for these services, not just for Plan Bs and Plan Cs, but also in, in terms of uh, healthcare. Maybe if you're a high net worth person in a jurisdiction where healthcare may not be the best, maybe you want to have your plan B or your new plan A to be somewhere where uh, the society has the capacity to deal with this. So this is just what I imagine. But I mean, you're the professional, you're the leader in this space. So what does this mean to your industry? Yes, yeah, so look, there's certainly been a shift in terms of our clients motive so the investment migration industry has always been driven by the lifestyle benefits the travel freedom that having a second passport can give you if, if you weren't lucky enough to be born with a with a with a strong passport from a travel perspective and of course you know the coronavirus has thrown that all out the window because if you you can have Singapore or Japanese passport, which is the best in the world, but you cannot use it because of the lockdown. So, mm. look, I think that that motive will certainly come back. You know, once once things clear up, the airports will open, business will be all about travel again. You know, there, there, there is there, there's a certain element of, of having these types of meetings. You know, will become more common in terms of the um, doing things online. But you know, in certain industries and in certain businesses, you cannot be to face to face meeting. Now the travel will come back. So I think that the travel freedom uh, objectives of our clients has for now been parked. Uh, and as you said, you know, now what's coming to the forefront is, is number one option. So that's always been their clients want options. Wealthy people 
um, like to have a hedge against everything, you know, from political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, and so that's always been a driver. But certainly, if um, if you have you know dual citizenship, if you have permanent residence or residence in two or three countries, you know that that gives you options, and that's what a lot of wealthy people are in. Uh, and particularly on the healthcare, I mean, we saw as soon as this started to kick off in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is world renowned for their healthcare systems. You know, all of a sudden, a lot of the wealthy guys from our, some of our neighbours were flying into Singapore to make sure that they had access. And again, you know, if they had had done their residence planning up front, um, they could have done the global investor program in Singapore. They would have permanent resident card here. They could get in. Um, and now the other interesting thing we see, and particularly out of the US, in places like Silicon Valley. I'm sure you've read some of these articles where a lot of the, you know, the, the, the ultra high net worth guys there also had this sort of pandemic planning in place. So a lot of them already have taken part in the investor visas in Australia and New Zealand. They've maybe got a farm there. Um, and, and the isolation or remoteness of those jurisdictions is now also seen as a big attraction. So mm. certainly a lot of clients are, are looking at, you know, what's available in investment migration. And now for the first time, the question is, you know, what is their pandemic preparedness? What's their response been like? And then you've got New Zealand as sort of the shining light uh, in terms of what countries have done. And of course, other countries, you know, potentially the US, the UK are not, not faring as well, although they do still have interesting um, investor migration programs of their own. So we're certain, we've certainly seen a shift in interest. Um, the, the, the typical reasons why clients come to us they are still there, uh, but we do have some that are sort of in a, in a wait and hold position until things open up. Uh, the nature of some of the countries where that offer these programs, and particularly in Europe, you know, the Portugal Golden uh, Residence Permit, the Greek Golden Visa, Cyprus, Malta, most of those countries at some point in the application process require the, the client to actually physically go there to do biometrics, to open bank accounts, whatever might be required. And of course, that now you know the clients just need to wait until that's possible. Mm. Okay, so I, I get the point that there's a shift in terms of motivation, but does that also translate into a shift in terms of destinations? The clients tend to look at Plan B. So is it that like your Australia, New Zealand, they're climbing the rankings in terms of desirability as opposed to other jurisdictions? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of studies in terms of the migration of high net worth individuals. Australia has, has for probably the last four to five years, always been the number one destination. You know, if you look at why why wealthy people would want to use an investor visa to move to another jurisdiction, it's, it's education, it's healthcare, mm -hmm. transport systems, uh, security, clean air. So Australia ticks a lot of those boxes, as does New Zealand, the US, Canada. So those four have have always been the traditional markets. I think if anything, um, what's happened now has certainly even increased their attractiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 I, and I think that, that's, a, that's a common theme now. So, so we even ran a webinar on Australia and New Zealand the other day, um, had a huge sign up for that, lots of interest. Uh, and, and again, I had, I had, I had an introduction from another law firm out of New York just today asking about the, the premium investor visa to Australia. So mm. we're certainly seeing more interest out of some of the markets that also aren't usually the typical markets we have our clients. And because the travel freedom is always the main driver, it's clients from China, India, Indonesia, where, they, where their passports are not good from a travel perspective. But now the likes of Australia, New Zealand, we've got a big family coming out of Zurich that's looking at New Zealand, the US, the UK, these are not sort of typical, you know, hunting grounds in terms of in terms of clients, um, but but for those people, you know, those destinations are certainly coming to the fore. Okay, I understand. Uh, so I mean, I get the U.S. because you know some people don't feel comfortable the politics or whatever, but Europe uh, and particularly uh, like Switzerland. I would have thought that that was more of like a destination rather than a source country. Is that a trend or are these just like one-offs? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a trend, but I would say there's a handful each year that that, that see it as a sort of bolt hole solution. You know, we have had some that, um, you know, the New Zealand program's interesting for a few reasons. Once 
the, the, the top end program is the investor one category. Mm -hmm. That's a, two, a 10 million New Zealand dollar investment. And, it, and it's quite flexible in terms of what that can go into as long as it's not for sort of your personal use. So a lot of people, not a lot of people, you know, you do have a handful um, that see as the ultimate sort of doomsday scenario plan. You know, you, you go and invest that into a commercial farm. That farm is sort of self-sufficient in terms of food, water. It's off the grid in terms of electricity. It's completely isolated. Um, with that category, uh, the, the, the investor, the, the, the family only needs to spend about 44 days a year, mm -hmm. so about a month and a half for each of the three years and after three years they get permanent residence in new zealand and the great thing about that is that it is really permanent you know there's there's no renewal requirements nothing so you do it you do your month and a half for three years you've got the investment there it's into something that's giving you a return and then you can you know still live in in switzerland in the us whatever you want but in a scenario like we find ourselves in now it's possible to get on a plane and, and be very far away from everything mm. Yeah. Understood. Understood. And what about in terms of UK? Brexit, how is that impacting this picture? So it's, a, it's another, look, I, to be honest, our industry is great because um, anything, any global event, whether it's something really horrible or something, I mean, maybe Brexit's arguably very horrible for some people, um, but, but anything like that increases interest because, again, you know, Brexit, the, the biggest impact Brexit has from a lot of our clients perspective is as a UK citizen, part of the EU, I can settle anywhere in the European Union. So they're now losing 27, you know, tier one European countries where they can no longer go and study and work and retire without having to worry about other visas and permits and that. So, so mm -hmm. that settlement freedom is now being taken away from, from British clients. And Obviously, the, the example there is, is now that opens up a new market for us because not only do we have UK citizens, I, I have one here in Singapore who are looking at either Malta or Cyprus to, to still be able to acquire that EU citizenship and provide their family and children with, with all the benefits that their UK passport used to provide them. But even some of the programs like, like the Portugal residence visa, um, Greek golden visa, you know, a lot of UK um, citizens have holiday homes there, have retirement plans there. So even if they're not necessarily ultra high net worth, where they're able to sort of play in the Malta and Cyprus space, because that ranges anywhere from a million to two and a half million euros. In Greece, you can do it for 250,000 euros. You can buy an apartment in Athens or even on, on one of the islands. The whole process takes about three months. You get permanent residence in Greece um, and that gives you that access again. So. Hmm. I think from 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 a from a UK citizen perspective, it's it's good for the industry because now they're interested in things that they wouldn't have beforehand because they didn't have to be, um, and vice versa. You know, we've had a lot of clients that previously would have done Malta or Cyprus or gone through some process uh, to get an EU citizenship on the premise that they could then go and settle in the UK. So that's now. Um, not possible, particularly if they're not settled there within the settlement period. Um, but of course, the UK has the Tier 1 investor visa, which, which is then is still an option for them. So either you have a lot of clients, a lot of clients want to go to, you know, be based in the UK. Um, as I've always said, you know, of all the clients we've done out of Southeast Asia that have done either Malta or Cyprus, very few move, you know. 95% of them are still in Manila and Jakarta and KL and Bangkok. Um, but those that have moved have gone to London. So there is still mm -hmm. that demand. Uh, of course, it's usually the focus is on the kids' education. Mm -hmm. um, but now, you know, the tier one investor visa is a two million pound investment into a UK registered actively trading company. So that can go into Vodafone shares or Unilever or something like that. So that's still very much on the table. And as I said, London is still a destination for a lot of wealthy people from Asia. Um, a lot of our clients use it just for the kids. So instead of sending the children, which a lot of um, these families like to do, is to send the kids to the UK to study, <clears throat> they typically do that on the tier four student visa. The student visa doesn't count towards them becoming a permanent resident. You know, you've got to be there under a different category. So where possible, and we do this in Australia and the US as well with the EB-5, it's often better to send the kids, as long as they're 18 and they're sort of going for their tertiary education, 
is to send them over on an investor visa. So the UK is the classic example. Um, the parents can gift the two million pounds to the child. That gets invested with you know one of the big banks there through an, into an investment portfolio, and the child is then starts studies on a tier one investor visa. And when he's finished after five years, he's then eligible to get permanent residence, which is indefinite leave to remain. And a year later, he can actually apply for citizenship as well. Mm, understood. Gotcha. So you mentioned the U.S. Uh, is the is there like a dampening of demand for the U.S. or is it still steady or is it on the upswing? How is it looking? Look, I think the demand is always there, but the, the, the process is, is what's, is what's um, making it very difficult, particularly for places like China and India. You know, that's where in Vietnam, that's where you typically see the biggest demand um, if we're talking about just the EB-5 program. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's still very attractive, even though they've, they've increased the uh, investment amounts last year. Um, there is some times uncertainty about it under the current administration, but I think the demand and the interest is there, but the reality is, you know, we're doing a lot in India now. Um, if you're an Indian citizen and you want to start that process, it's probably going to take four to five years before you can go. If you're Chinese, you're looking at probably 14 to 15 years. Wow. Um, so that's a long sort of horizon. Um, the nice thing, of course, in the investment migration industry is there's there's other routes to the U.S. You know, so the, the U.S. has a very interesting uh, E2 investor visa, um, not really that well known. Um, interesting for clients in Asia because the E2 is only available to E2 treaty member countries with the U.S. And, and of course, India, China, these places are not E2 treaty members. Mm -hmm. But if you look in the investment migration space now, there's three countries, so Grenada, in the Caribbean, Montenegro, and Turkey. So all three have citizenship by investment programs where I can invest and become a citizen, and they are E2 treaty members. So I can first, so the, the normal sort of process, it's typically done through Grenada in the Caribbean, um, because you can get a, a five-year E2 validity, is the client would first become a Grenada citizen. That takes, say, roughly six months, and it would be about a either a $200,000 donation to the government or about uh, 220000 into property. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as a Grenada citizen, they can apply for the E2. It's a non-immigrant visa, so it's not going to give them a green card or citizenship, which actually some clients prefer. Mm -hmm. You don't automatically fall under the tax net unless you're spending six months there. Mm -hmm. um, but you can go and live in the U.S. You can start a business with that E2 investment. Um, and the kids can, of course, study and you can move to the U.S. So you can take a... A Chinese family who's going to take 15 years under an EB-5 mm -hmm. um, can, can actually do it with a Grenada or a Montenegro E2 combination and do it in under a year. Mm. Wow. And it, what about the Caribbean? I've seen some press that uh, certain of the islands are discounting their donation and moving more crap. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this, this often happens typically on the back of sort of the hurricane seasons. You know, these islands, unfortunately, often get, you know, quite badly affected when these hurricanes come through. So a lot of, a lot of um, the, the main sort of discounting of prices happened back in, when was it, 2016, 2017, um, where effectively some of the islands, you know, cut that donation amount in half. So they used to all roughly be around the 200 mark. Now they're all similarly between sort of a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars depending on the size of the family and mm -hmm. um, probably the most interesting one that's come out of, of the caribbean of late is, is in st lucia so st lucia have just announced that they've always had a government bond option mm -hmm. um, which wasn't very attractive uh, we've pretty much had no clients that did it uh, but that was a half a million bond they've now halved that uh, requirement to 250 and it's a specific COVID-19 COVID bond that the client can invest into for five years mm -hmm. in order to acquire citizenship. So already some of these countries are becoming a bit innovative and reacting to what's happening because of the pandemic. Um, of course, they can raise significant foreign direct investment through these programs. Uh, I was talking on a, 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 another webinar earlier about this concept of sovereign equity. So usually, and we'll see this more and more out of this pandemic, there's big you know, support packages coming out from all the governments. We've seen it in Singapore. Um, the UK is certainly doing it. 
uh, and that will continue to happen as the pandemic sort of the effects are felt. Mm -hmm. So I think more and more countries are going to either those that have investment migration programs will make adjustments. Mm -hmm. We saw Italy last week halve the requirements in Italy. They've got one of these golden visa programs. Uh, and certainly we can see on our government advisory side, a lot of governments and countries are now starting to look at these programs. And if they're, if they're structured correctly, the due diligence is really, at, you know, at a very high level, um, they can, as I said, you know, why go in and raise more debt, uh, debt levels around the world are now, I think, just topped over $255 trillion. Mm -hmm. When you have, you know, a huge population of high net worth around the world um, that are willing to rather inject this sort of you know, direct inflows into countries, this creating sovereign equity as opposed to debt in exchange for either residence or citizenship in that country. Mm, okay, that's fair enough. And the way in which uh, various jurisdictions treated with the pandemic, do you see it having an impact? So for example, uh, MM2H Malaysia, even though you are a long-term resident of Malaysia, when things got locked down, if you're a citizen, you can get back in but some mm 2 is people were stranded outside of their homes. And similarly, you know, people that have been in Singapore for a really long time uh, weren't allowed back in uh, at certain points in time. So as a result of that, do you see that potentially, and I'm just using those two as an example, but would that be a decisive factor going forward, bearing in mind that many speculate that we will have subsequent waves and, and we're probably like a year to two off from some sort of vaccine. So the cycle of lockdown, open up, lockdown, open up will continue. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, um, I mean, the key thing is most, most the really successful programs in the world are typically providing either citizenship, which, you know, you, you don't have this sort of, if you look at, if you take the MM2H as an example in Malaysia, you know, it's, it's not really a resident permit. It's, it's a long-term visit pass. It's a stamp on your passport that allows you to live there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not permanent residence. It's never going to lead to permanent residence. It's never going to lead to citizenship. And those are more permanent states. And, and crucially in times like this, it affords you more protection from that state. Mm -hmm. So citizenship is always going to be the preferred option. And, and if you're allowed dual citizenship, you should certainly you should certainly get it. You know, we have a lot of clients, of course, that were sort of sitting on the fence and waiting, and now they realise we should have done it when we could have. It wasn't yeah. just us trying to push them to be a client. You know, yeah. um, so citizenship is always going to be your best state. I mean, if I look at myself, mm -hmm. you know, as a South African, if it's not Singapore, I'm back in South Africa. They have had a very strict lockdown. But if I have a Malta citizenship, I, I have you know the whole of Europe. I can technically go back into. Uh, with certain restrictions on the travel side so mm. you know the, the, not all these programs are designed the same so some are more sort of a long-term visit pass some are more of a tourist visa that they provide mm. um, the real attraction is always citizenship number one permanent residence number two and then and then sort of a, a more temporary residence leading up to those positions because as, as you as i said um you know you, you get a lot more protection from the state and much more support and and that if, if you are a citizen, um, and if not, then at least a permanent resident. Okay, that's good. That's great. So my final question is this, you know, when I go online or when anyone goes online, there, there are just so many options because essentially this industry, for want of a better word, is fairly unregulated. So completely, <laughs> completely unregulated. So if I am a potential customer and somebody looking at this, how do I decide which firms I could probably stay away from and which firms are probably the best for me to work with. Yeah, look, it's one of, it's one of the, the big challenges of the industry, not just us as sort of one of the leaders in the space. Mm -hmm. um, it is not regulated and and it's, this as in any unregulated industry, there are sort of, you know, service providers that are, are not necessarily acting in the client's interest. They're trying to make a quick quick back and you know they probably won't even be there in a year or two's time so we are we are very pro regulation um we we've obviously structured ourselves to align with you know the private banks and that, that we work very closely with so we we have very strict onboarding policies for clients and, and all of these types of things mm -hmm. um there is if you as you say if you go online there, there's plenty sort of of these small competitors i mean the usual thing you know check their track record 
Um, do they really have offices in all these jurisdictions and teams that they can assist you with? Are they, are, they, are they registered? So in the Caribbean, you can go onto the official government websites and you can see who the registered agents are. Same in places like Montenegro and Cyprus and Malta. It's very clear who is actually licensed to do these things. So you don't want to be dealing with sort of a middleman who's then dealing with another agent who's then dealing with another law firm. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, we've built ourselves a, a very large global footprint of 30 offices so that we can control the whole process from A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, the other thing to look out for is because there's no regulation, a lot of the sort of bigger, sort of more reputable players in the industry got together. So whether that's, you know, obviously Henley was one of those, but you've got, you know, Fragman, who you know, I'm sure you, you know who Fragman is, a couple of the big four got together and said, listen, we, we need to have some sort of a, a, a one sort of profit entity that ensures a certain level of, of ethics, best practice, principles, education in the industry. And on the back of that um, was uh, came the Investment Migration Council. So the Investment Migration Council uh, is based out of Geneva. It's a non-profit, um, but it's very much at the forefront of, of making sure that, you know, whoever their members are, are acting in a very certain way and always, of course, in the client's interest. So, you know, even if the client doesn't want to deal with, with Henley for whatever reason, uh, maybe just have a look and, and check that these guys are at least members of the other of a body like the IMC, uh, because then you know there's a certain level of service you're going to get, and you're not going to deal with just some guy who's sort of got a website and a picture of a beach in the Caribbean. <laughs> gotcha. Dominic, thank you for your.